Thanks, Pastor J.D. If you have your Bibles, I want you to meet me in the book of Philemon. It is one of the shortest books in all the scriptures, although I cannot guarantee you it will be one of the shortest sermons you'll ever hear in your, in your life. Uh, as a way to just kind of tie a bow, we again continue to acknowledge that we're in the middle of a very heavy season. As we close every service like we typically do, there are going to be opportunities to pray. Uh, some of you, you're going to hear the gospel and the Spirit of God is going to do something in your heart and life and uh, you're going to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, and we've got some people who'd love to pray with you about that. Others of you, there's going to be something specific about the message that's going to hit you right where you are, and uh, you're going to feel maybe challenged by it, convicted by it, and maybe you want some prayer over that. That's going to be available to you. But others of you just kind of walked in here with a heavy heart, again, because of all of, of, of which we've been through in our culture recently. We have some people who would love to, absolutely love to pray with you. I, I need to say a word of prayer for myself, among other reasons. Uh, my inner introvert is in distress after Hank had me sing to other people. Um, so <laughs> let me say a word of prayer. We can dive right in. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, yes, because of the cross and the empty tomb, we have hope. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would speak to us from your word, this brief letter, so much to say to us. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would be with me as I just simply scatter the seed of your word. I pray that it falls on good ground, takes root, bears much fruit. Confront us, encourage us, but ultimately change us, I pray. In Jesus' name, I ask all these things, amen. Pick me up in verse 8 of the book of Philemon. The guy who wrote this, his name is Paul, and Paul says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you. This is a bit of a play on words. Onesimus means useful. But now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent. In order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, one translation says a slave, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of you owing me even your own self. Paul's like, you want to keep score? Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. <laughs> oh, man, this is so passive aggressive here. Confident of your obedience in a good way, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me. <laughs> this is funny. Like, I want you to take them back. I trust you'll do the right thing. Uh, but I also plan on visiting you, so prepare a guest room so I can see if you did what I asked you to do. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Amen. In Mary Carr's wonderful memoir, The Liars Club, she tells a time in which her married aunt and uncle got into just a knockdown, down drag-out argument over a package of sugar. Obviously, the uncle had in his mind how much a package of sugar should cost, and his wife, Mary Carr's aunt, spends exponentially more for that package of sugar than what he thought it should be. They get into an argument, kind of tit for tat, back and forth. Both sides dig in. Neither side is willing to budge. And finally, things escalate to the point where, in a rage, Mary Carr's uncle takes out a lumber saw, saws, cuts the house in half, takes some wooden planks, true story, nails it on either side there to smooth the rough, rough edges out. He moves into one side of the house while she, his estranged wife, is on the other side of the house. True story. And there they live for the next 
40 years over a package of sugar. Now, I believe the best in you, so I'm going to go out on a limb and just go, none of y'all have ever done that. But I know we all know what it's like to cut people off or to have people cut us off. We all know what it's like to just experience fractures and fissures in relationships. The reality of sin, and we'll talk about this in just a few moments, sin is not just personal. It's profoundly relational and and social. And so you put two very flawed, sinful people together under the banner of any kind of relationship, there's there's bound to be pockets of turbulence. There are going to be times when I'm going to let you down and disappoint you deeply. I don't mean to. I'm a sinner, and there's going to be times in which you let me down. It's just kind of the nature of things, and we've all been there. Maybe right now in an audience this this large, some of you, uh, maybe you've got a sibling you're estranged from, a sibling you haven't spoken to in quite some time. It can be it can be tough having relationships with with family members. In fact, right after service, I've got I to drive down and spend wonderful time with some family members, and we're going to spend a whole week together. I typically have a three-day rule because right around 72 hours in, you're like, oh, yeah, that's why we live six hours apart. <laughs> so I, I know what can go along with that. Others of you, maybe for very good reasons, there's a, there's a parent that you're estranged from a child that you're estranged from. Others of you, maybe, maybe this is kind of what you're experiencing in your marriage right now. I mean, when you first got married, man, the two words that kind of describe the excitement and the elation you were feeling on your wedding day were just married. And now decades later, things have devolved to a certain point where you could use those same two words but say them a whole lot differently, just Married. Maybe it's a friendship that's gone south. Y'all used to be tight, thick as thieves. Y'all used to ride tandem bikes together, but but now you're you're not even speaking, and you're praising God for caller ID. Who hasn't been there? My concern this morning is is not that there is relational duress that we all experience. My concern this morning is I am a little bit leery that in our current cultural milieu, this whole cancel culture thing, that that we're more than okay with our fractured relationships and estrangements. We live in a society of exes, ex-friends, ex-colleagues, ex-acquaintances. This has become the waters we swim in. And it's more than okay. Add to this a large church like ours and multi-services, multi-campuses. I've, I've pastored in this setting before and praise God for the growth. But if we're not careful, you know, we get sideways with somebody. We used to meet before service together. All of a sudden we start going to a different service or all of a sudden we start going to a different campus and, and we can just become really comfortable with a collection of estranged relationships. David Brooks, Jesus loving writer. He's one of my favorite writers that's out there. He writes frequently for the New York Times. He says this, will you look at it with me? Our society suffers from a crisis of connection, a crisis of solidarity. We live in a culture of hyper-individualism. There is always a tension between self and society, between the individual and the group. Over the past 60 years, he continues, we have swung too far toward the self. The only way out is to rebalance, to build a culture that steers people toward relation, community, and commitment, the things we most deeply yearn for, yet undermine with our hyper-individualistic way of life, yes and amen. 
I want us to come now to the book of Philemon. I want us to hang out here for a couple of weeks. I know we're in the middle of another uh, series, God's Goodness in the Middle. So we're going to do these kind of two series around the same time. Uh, Just kind of imagine binge watching two of your favorite TV shows on Netflix all at the same time. But I want us to steep the book of Philemon. If there's one message that that the book of Philemon screams, which is why it is so relevant today, is Paul wants us to understand that in the body of Christ, there are to be no exes. He's uncomfortable with two believers who aren't speaking. In order to get our arms around this, we have to understand We're introduced to a person by the name of Philemon. We understand that Philemon is a wealthy individual. We know that he's wealthy because the church at Colossae meets in his house. It's a wealthy individual. His home there is in Colossae. It's right smack dab in the middle of the Lycus Valley. We also know that he's wealthy because unfortunately he's gone the way of the culture. He's a slave owner. One of his slaves is a young man by the name of Onesimus. One day, Onesimus says, enough is enough, throws up the deuces, I'm out. It's always interesting to me, by the way, listening to biblical scholars trying to explain the difference between slavery in the Bible versus slavery in the antebellum South. I do appreciate some of the differences, but I want you to understand there's a yearning in Onesimus because he understands at the core of his being, people don't own people. So one day, Onesimus, maybe, maybe it had just been stirring up in him for so long. He's just kind of this restlessness. I wasn't created to be owned by someone. I'm out. Maybe, maybe Philemon did something that day that set him over the edge. Maybe he spoke to him in a less than than humanizing way. Maybe he treated him harshly. Maybe he lashed out at him physically. We don't know. Those details are left out. But but Onesimus is again, I'm out. Now it's at this point where Onesimus faces a conundrum that every slave would face, leaving his owner. How, how am I going to make it out there on my own? I don't have any resources. And so what most scholars tell us, it's at this point where Onesimus steals from Philemon to fund his flight. I gotta pay for transportation some kind of a way. I've, I've gotta pay for shelter and food some kind of a way. I'm a slave, I don't have anything. So he steals from Philemon to fund his flight. We catch a hint of this in our text. R- remember, I read it to you. Paul says, hey Philemon, I want you to take him back. Oh, by the way, if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. Paul is acknowledging that there's some wrong that's happened here. Onesimus should never have stolen from Paul. The next thing we know is that Onesimus meets Paul. Now, again, I want to pull you into two streams of scholarship here. Hang in there with me. I promise you I'm coming to your neighborhood. I'm just setting the context here. I want you to feel the story. One set of biblical scholarship says that Onesimus, uh, to use a worldly word, just kind of randomly ran into Paul. That he just ran into Paul, who happens to be in Rome, by happenstance. What the world would call coincidence, but, but what we believers would call providence. I reject that. I align with another stream of biblical scholars. Remember, the church at Colossae meets in Philemon's home. Uh, At one point, Philemon owned Onesimus. Onesimus was working in the home, which means Onesimus would have heard of Paul. So I actually believe that Onesimus leaves Colossae. It makes the 80 to 100 mile journey to Rome to intentionally find Paul who's in prison. He meets with Paul. Hey man, how you doing? What are you doing here? And this man shares his story, what's going on, and Paul shares the good news of Jesus Christ with him. Again, I want you to look at verse 10. Here is Paul, he says, I'm, I'm writing on behalf of my child, uh, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. He's using spiritual language to say, while in prison, I led Onesimus to faith in Jesus Christ. 
Absolutely spellbinding. Uh, Onesimus comes to faith in Jesus Christ. He understands that, that his relationship with God was estranged, and yet God did the unthinkable. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for him, a slave. And Onesimus now becomes a believer, and Paul says, hey, I, I want to just kind of disciple you. I want to walk you through some things. So they set up a discipleship appointment, and, and Onesimus comes back to jail. Paul shares with him about the essentials and the basics of the Christian faith over the next couple weeks together. They're getting to know one another. Paul hears Onesimus' story, and then one day Paul says, hey, Onesimus, we've been getting to know each other. I'm so grateful you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. But i, I got to say something to you, o Onesimus. I, I know that you and Philemon have fallen out. I actually need you to go back and make it right. <sighs> what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to aid and abet two believers estrangement. Go back, make it right. Because Paul understood in the body of Christ, there are to be no exes. Wow. If there's one word that canvases the whole letter of Philemon, it's this word. If you miss this, you miss Philemon. It's reconciliation. Reconciliation is the bringing together of former enemies. Reconciliation is not forgiveness. Reconciliation is a step beyond forgiveness. Forgiveness is, is a releasing of the debt. In the Greek, it literally means ascending away of the offense. Forgiveness is what every believer is required to do, Matthew chapter 18. Reconciliation is the restoration of the relationship. See, you can forgive and not be reconciled, but you can never be reconciled and not forgive. While forgiveness has a loophole, excuse me, while forgiveness does not have a loophole, reconciliation does have a loophole. Romans 12, 18, Paul, the same guy who writes to Philemon, says these words, as best as you can, be at peace with all men. I love that. Paul is acknowledging it takes two to be reconciled, which means there are some times where you do your best. It just doesn't work. I want you to view reconciliation as the salad dressing in your refrigerator. I could say this with confidence in California. I'm just getting to know you all, but right now all of our refrigerators have salad dressing. Salad dressing is made up of oil and water, two things that don't get along. Certain kinds of salad dressing, when they sit there, the natural course of things are these two elements, oil and water, to be estranged, to separate. That's why with certain kinds of salad dressing, when you're ready to use it, you don't just pour it, you, you have to intentionally shake it. There's intentionality. Why do you intentionally shake it? You're, you're working reconciliation in that salad dressing. You are bringing together two things that don't get along. Paul wants us to understand in this text, if reconciliation is going to happen, it is not going to happen by happenstance or by osmosis. It happens by intentionality. The book of Philemon gives us three ingredients that we have to shake together to experience not just reconciliation, but these three ingredients go into every healthy, flourishing relationship. And these three ingredients, they are each personified in the main characters in our text. First, there's grace. There can be no reconciliation without grace. Think about it. The relationship is estranged because someone has offended somebody else. In fact, if you study Philemon, here's what we understand. Both individuals are at fault. Onesimus, you should, have stole, you should not have stolen. And Philemon, you shouldn't have gone along with the culture and owned people. So typically what happens... And I've done pastoral ministry enough to know this. When you sit down with two individuals and there's a falling out, typically there's mutual culpability. It might not be 50-50. A lot of times, maybe it's 90-10, 95-5. But typically, I played a part in the destruction of the relationship. 
And so if it's gonna get back on track, there's gotta be grace. That's why Paul says to Philemon, listen, I know he's wronged you. I, I, I know he's stolen from you, but I need you to take him back. Philemon, you and Onesimus will never get along in a healthy relationship unless you give him what he does not deserve, which is grace. But you also need truth. Paul personifies truth. Reconciliation is not acting like it never happened. Reconciliation is facing the wrong. Telling the truth. So Paul personifies truth. He says, oh, now I got to tell you something hard. So grateful you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You got to go back. Philemon, I got to tell you something hard. I know he stole from you. I know he wronged you. Show him grace. Grace and truth, they make up love. I'm thinking parenthetically now of Tim Keller. Tim Keller, he, he, he says, to love without being known, that's truth, is superficial sentimentality. To love without being known, it's superficial sentimentality. I remember once, if you hear a person chuckle, it's my wife. I remember once I was dating a young lady, not my wife. Uh, in a weekend, my wife knows this story, this young lady, she paged me. Um... <laughs> This thing we used to wear on the hip. And I had, a, I had the cool one. Like you called into the operator, you left the message, and the message would scroll across the screen of the pager. She called the operator, this young lady did, a week in, and she left a message, I love you. A week in. Don't laugh, I was a smooth operator back in the day. <laughs> now, if you ask me what I thought about this, I thought two things. Number one, I freaked out. My wife calls this young lady cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> but secondly, her words meant nothing. There's no way you could say that to me and carry any weight, and you don't know me. To love and not be known, it's superficial sentimentality. But Tim Keller goes on to say, to be known and to not loved is our deepest fear. What we need is both grace and truth. I know everything about you, and I'm not leaving the table of fellowship. I'm embracing you. So we need grace. We need truth. But thirdly, we need repentance. The breakdown to any relationship means I have violated you. I have sinned against you. Repentance is not confession. Confession is a Greek word, homologeo, which means to say the same thing. Confession is a change of words. Repentance is a change of action. In other words, let me just say this. If there's going to be the restoration of the relationship, we've got to be able to apologize. Let me give you a tutorial on healthy biblical apologies. Biblical apologies are not, I'm sorry you took it that way. Biblical apologies take ownership. Own it. They're specific. Here is specifically what I am owning. And biblical apologies, I believe, at the end make the big ask. What is the big ask? Will you forgive me? Wow. But notice, he says, Onesimus, thanks for making the 80 to 100 mile trek from Colossae to Rome, but I actually need you to go back. And it, that, that, that is a visual of repentance. Turn from where you are and go in the opposite direction. If you are in relationship with anybody who violates you and refuses to repent, we call that abuse. So I want you to get in your mind right now just a picture of a person, you've probably already been seeing them of an estranged relationship in your life. Maybe you were the Onesimus. Jesus would say this to you, Matthew chapter five, if therefore you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your, I love that as a pastor, leave your gift. <laughs> he doesn't say take it home with you. Leave it. Go and make it right. Maybe you're the Philemon in here. You've been wronged. 
Jesus is saying to you, I need you to do to that person who wronged you what I do to you every day. Show grace. And there has to be truth. (sighs) Brian, why should I go through all that? Parenthetically, let 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 me just say this. We are not talking about cases of abuse. It's very important for me to say that. You're called to forgive. I think in those cases, reconciliation is off the table. By the way, you can forgive and prosecute at the same time. Brian, why should I go through all of this? This is a lot of work. I'm tired. It's a lot of work. I always say as a pastor, pastoring would be so much easier if it wasn't for the people. Like if people were books, perfect. (laughs) Why should I go through all of this? Answer the gospel. The gospel begins on a note of sin. The good news, the Uang Galeon, begins on a note of sin. And one of the things the Bible just shows us over and over and over and over again is that sin is never just personal, it is profoundly relational. I could take it to Genesis chapter two. At the end of Genesis chapter two, it says of Adam and Eve and their relationship, they were naked and not ashamed. I think this is illustrative. In other words, their physical transparency and vulnerability was an, it was an, uh, an illustration of their emotional and soul level uh, transparency and vulnerability. There was just a sense of we're, we're not hiding from each other. Everything's on the table. Then a couple of verses later, what happens? Eve eats of the fruit, turns to give to her husband who was passively taking in this home a whole scenario, sin enters into the world. And what's the first thing they do? They look for fig leaves to hide from one another. Vulnerability, transparency, out the window, and they hide from God. See how the relationships are impacted? That's what we do. The message here is sin is not just personal, it's social, it's it's relational. Look at their kids. Cain kills Abel. Look at Joseph, his brothers, sell him out, sell him into slavery. I mean, over and over and over again, the Bible is clear. Sin wreaks havoc on relationships. Praise God for the antidote of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ says that the primary relationship that was hindered was our relationship with God. We were all Onesimus. All of us had offended God. All of us gone unto our own way. We were wandering like sheep, and I I love it. God doesn't wait for us to go back to him because in our fallen nature, we would not have done it. God comes down to us. So if you really want to know if you understand vertical reconciliation and what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 19, when he says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. If you really, 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 really want to know if I get the gospel and the fact that I've been vertically reconciled, do you labor at horizontal reconciliation? What you really believe about reconciliation is seen in your horizontal relationships with others. That's why Matthew 18 says an unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. That's why Luke 12 says a greedy Christian is an oxymoron. Why should I give myself to the work of repairing this relationship? Number one, the gospel. Number two, because we're family. Come here, come here. You don't need to spend a day in seminary to get this. I love it. Just look at the language Paul uses in this letter. Look at verse one. Paul, a prison for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, how does he describe him? Our brother. To Philemon, our, uh, to Philemon, our beloved uh, fellow worker in Aphia. Now, that's Philemon's wife. How does he call her? Our sister. Look at verse seven. How does he refer to Philemon? My brother. Look at how he refers to Onesimus in verse 10. My child, whose father I became. 
I mean, just, just look at verse 20. Again, here's how he refers to Philemon. Yes, brother. Over and over and over and over and over again, he uses familial language to talk about estranged people. His message is this, we're family. The person you're sitting next to isn't some stranger. That's not a person in a different tax bracket. We are family. And when we really get family, that adds a weight of responsibility to working out reconciliation. That's why you want to rip a parent's heart out. Have them have two kids who refuse to get along. You want to rip God's heart out, have him have his kids don't get along. Why should I give myself to this? Because regardless of our ethnicity, our class, our culture, we carry the blood of Jesus Christ in our spiritual DNA, and that is the most powerful reconciling force in the world. So let me give you a couple of, a couple of analogies. I want you to cement this idea in your mind that when I really get we're family, that there's a gravitational pull towards reconciliation. I, I think now of, if you're not a believer, maybe you've, it's one of the more popular stories in the Bible. It's, uh, it's been labeled the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. I'd encourage you to read it. Uh, here we have the youngest, uh, the youngest son comes to the father, Jewish father, Jewish son, and he says to him, give me my share of the inheritance now. Now, as Jesus is telling that story, the Jews in the audience are aghast. Why? Because they understand to ask your dad for your share of the inheritance now while he's still living is the cultural equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead. That's what the son is doing. What, is, what does the dad do? He doesn't push back. Here you go. Ripped his heart out. Here you go, just ripping my heart out. Son takes it, goes off to a far country, uh, wastes it, one translation says, on riotous living, spends it on, on immorality. He even depletes his funds and in a sovereign twist of irony ends up working this Jewish kid as a pig farmer. He wakes up one day at the end of himself and says, I need to go home, but he knows I've offended my dad. Maybe he'll take me back as a hireling, as a hired servant. So that's what I'll do. I'll I'll just kind of appeal to him that way. So he makes his way home. His dad's sitting on the porch there, sees a familiar figure running down the street, realizes that's my youngest son. He then does the unthinkable. No Jewish man would run. This man runs after his father, after his son. His son just kind of shares his heart. Dad, I've wronged you. I'm coming back as a hireling, as a hired servant. Dad says, none of that. You're my son. We're going to kill the fattened calf. We're going to throw you a party. Moving visual of reconciliation. Why? Because we're family. This next one's a little personal. My dad's sister used to drive him nuts. Dad's got two sisters. It's it's my Aunt Elena, you just drive nuts, man. I remember being a kid and just picking up on the fact that Aunt Elena ain't good with money. She'd make foolish decision after foolish decision after foolish decision with money, and she'd get into a pickle, couldn't pay rent, call my dad. I'd hear my dad fuss, and we'd been through this all the time, and then sure enough, he'd bail her out. Over and over and over again. I just remember one time, like 19 years old, seeing my dad get off the phone again, and Dad, why do you keep doing this over and over again? I'll never forget what he said. What am I going to do? Am I going to let them kind of put my sister out on the street? And then he said, we're family. At the end of the day, family's all you got. Postscript. About 20 years ago, my Aunt Elena died. Battled with breast cancer. She, she, She died. At the funeral, I'll never forget Aunt Elena in the casket, my dad standing next to his sister in the casket, and he's laughing and crying and laughing and crying. I'm like, Dad, what's up? He's like, she got me again. Guess who's paying for this? I'm not saying that to say you got to constantly bail people out. And did my dad cross the threshold of enablement? Probably so. But what I want you to see is when we understand we're family. I think we lost that in 2020. 
I think we lost that. We're family. Let's go home on this one. Paul wants us to understand reconciliation is hard. I hope this is a safe space. It's impossible to do theology completely objective. Um, Part of me being created in the image of God is God's created me as a black man and I read this text and I'm not really pleased with Paul if I can just be honest with you. Paul, I want you to say, hey Philemon, knock it off, we don't own people. That's what I want him to say. So, so, so just imagine, Onesimus, you gotta go back. And if I'm Onesimus, are you crazy? Are you crazy? And if I'm Onesimus, maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig in. And now Paul writes Philemon, and he says, I want you to take him back. And I just see, see Philemon go, are you crazy? Are you crazy? He stole from me. He's a slave. He doesn't have the means to pay me. I just kind of see both sides digging in, not budging. Hear me. There's always a good reason not to reconcile. In my years of pastoral ministry, you sit down with two people who've gone sideways with another. It's like watching a, a, a tennis match. A good point, a good point, a good point, good, good point. Add, deuce, add, deuce. It's back and forth. And, and you want to go, good point, but who's going to lay down their rights? Because if we're going to keep score, Jesus could have easily said, I got a good reason not to come but he laid down his rights. In 1986, two ships collided in the Black Sea. It was a catastrophe. Hundreds of people died. What's interesting is in the aftermath, investigators tried to get to the root of the crash and how did this happen? And what they found was even more tragic. These two ships that collided and crashed, killing hundreds of lives, they crashed not because of mechanical failure or a technological deal. They crashed because they both saw each other coming and they both refused to budge. Is that you? Just digging in on this one? Who are you not giving an inch with? Many of us have maybe gone through the process of trying to get a mortgage. I love the word mortgage. It's Latin for death grip. (laughs) And you try to get a mortgage. In essence, what you're saying is, I want a relationship with the bank. And the bank's like, oh, so cute. Show us your credit report. Credit report kind of has everything. If we've got debts, it's on there and helps to discern whether or not we're good at paying those debts back in a timely manner. And sometimes the bank will get that credit report and be like, hey, you know, we, we need you to clear some things up. There's a, your debt to income ratio is off. So we need you to remove some of these things in order for us to have a relationship. I, 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 I love what Paul is doing here because even though I get frustrated as a black man reading this because I want him to emphasize emancipation, you have to understand that Paul isn't against emancipation. In fact, he actually takes a swipe at slavery here. He says, I want you to take him back no longer as a slave. I want you to take him back as a brother. Hear me, Paul's bottom line in Philemon isn't emancipation, it's reconciliation. Because Paul understands you can emancipate someone and not be reconciled, but you can't be reconciled without emancipating. 
U.S. history shows that. We, we emancipated people, but to this day, we're not really reconciled. So Paul says, deal with the issue. If he owes you anything, let's get it off his credit report. But at the end of the day, you're brothers. Here's what I want you to understand. You will never do the work of reconciliation until you first understand, I'm Onesimus. I'm the one with the spiritual and moral jacked up credit report. I'm the one in debt to God. I couldn't pay my debt. I couldn't clean myself up, but God came running to me. Save me by his grace. When you truly see yourself as Onesimus, you'll be positioned, and, and hear me, I get it. I get it as best you can, which means some cases it won't work. It won't work if you won't apologize. It won't work if you won't repent. It won't work if you won't show me grace. But have you done your best? Let's all stand. Let's all stand. I want to do something a little different as we prepare to send you out to submit this visual that we're family here. Would you just would, would you just grab the hand of the person next to you? And maybe we could even stretch out across the aisles and grab hands if that if that'll work. This has just been an awkward Sunday, I know. We've been singing to each other. Now we're holding hands. I don't want you to forget this picture. We're family. So Father, I bless you. I, I, I thank you that when we weren't thinking of you, you came down to do the work of reconciliation. And by your grace, you saved we Onesimuses. You've given us a hope. You've given us a future. God, I'm not here to make light of the hurt, the offense. And I'm not saying we reconcile overnight. But Father, you by your spirit, you take your word and you apply it to us right now, whatever that looks like whatever that looks like. We say yes to you. So I send us out now in the name of the reconciling Son of God that people would ultimately say of Summit Church, that's that people who love one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Summit family.